too. Hey, tonight I'm super excited. We're talking about Kirtland. Anything to do with Kirtland excites me. Kirtland is awesome. Everything that happened in Kirtland and everything did happen in Kirtland. And it's really fantastic. Um, so much happened that I need to give a disclaimer and tell you that we're not going to get through it all tonight. As fast as I talk sometimes and as much as I want to tell you everything, it, it, to get through Kirtland, we need to do about 10 hours uh, together. And I'm working on that. Um, and as I get more Kirtland videos out, I'll, I'll put them on the blog. I'll email them out to you and, um, and so that you have them available. But tonight of those 10 hours or so that, uh, that would do Kirtland a little bit of justice, we're only going to get through 45 minutes or so of it. So there's my disclaimer that tonight we're just going to kind of get the ball rolling and started and, uh, and then just watch for, for more videos or, or whatever that, uh, that, that I'm working on. And that's, um, that's coming. So stay tuned. Uh, hey, before or as we get started into Kirtland, let me let me give you a short story that I think is kind of fun and really, really entertaining. And it goes like this. The Saints had to leave Kirtland eventually. They ended up in far west with the Missouri Saints. And the reason they left Kirtland is because the persecution was getting so um, difficult. And the persecution was such that Joseph's life was in danger quite often uh, to the point where he had bodyguards. Uh, that would be with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just to be there more as a, as a presence of, uh, of some muscle that was there with the prophet um, to deter the, the uh, bad guys from actually going through with the threats, the threats that they were making. Um, and so Joseph was in his home and he had his bodyguards there and it was the time to, of the changing of the guards, uh, if you will. Uh, where a couple of men would come to relieve the guards who had been spending the rest of the, the day with Joseph. And these two guards were going to uh, stay awake and, and watch over Joseph and his family that night. Well, the one guard who uh, was, was coming brought his son to introduce him to the prophet. And then he'd send his son on, the, on his way home um, to, to go and back and sleep in his own bed. Uh, and so he was just there, intent, it was intended that the little boy would be there just for a moment. Well, the two guards show up, the one with his little boy. And Joseph says, brother, you know, he just expressed his gratitude uh, for, for what they were doing to make him and his, his family feel safe. And he asked this little boy, who was about 12, a deacon, or deacon age, uh, if he would say a prayer before they adjourned and, and uh, for the night. And this little boy did. And the little boy asked Heavenly Father to protect the prophet. And at the end of the prayer, the prophet emotional, emotionally said, Brethren, I don't need your service tonight. The Lord has heard the prayer of this little boy, and I will be safe and protected. And he dismissed all, all the guards to go home to their families. And of course, Joseph was safe that, that night in answer to that little boy's prayer. Um, that's, that's one, it, uh, I don't mean to minimize the, the size of the miracle of that story, but that's one of hundreds of miracles that occurred during the Kirtland era. And I wanna, I'm excited to share a few of them with you. Um, another story that I'll share with you um, in regards to tonight's topic about the Savior specifically and his physical reality of being in Kirtland. We're going to talk a little bit about that. One of those stories goes like this. Um, Joseph, in that same home there, if you've been to Kirtland, it's, his, it's the white home where he and his family lived next to the cemetery. The cemetery sits between Joseph's house and the temple. And it's in that little white house <clears throat> that Joseph is holding what he calls a prayer meeting. We call it family home evening or, or come follow me type of lesson. And there's several people there. The room is crowded, <clears throat> and they're having this prayer meeting. Joseph's preaching, and one of the little girls uh, who's there um, it, it describes Joseph as, at one point in the meeting, standing up and being so full of light. It was as if there was a searchlight, or we'd call it just a big old flashlight that was inside him, shining out. And so bright and powerful was that light that his face became translucent where she could see his cheekbones. He was just so full of the spirit. It was at that point that he invited everybody in his house to kneel down and pray. This same little girl would testify in her journal that the prayer was so long that several in attendance, including herself, stood up and rubbed their knees 
to kind of bring them back to life. And then they get back down on their knees and continue on enduring through, uh, through Joseph's prayer. Well, at the end of the prayer, the, he, Joseph invites his the friends and, and neighbors who are there in the hall to return to their seats. And Joseph asks a very simple question. Brothers and sisters, do you know who's been in your midst tonight? And everybody was stunned. They didn't say anything. Finally, somebody was brave enough to say, Joseph, was it an angel? Joseph said, no, it wasn't an angel. Then Martin Harris, the Martin Harris, was in that meeting. And he said, Joseph, it was the Savior, wasn't it? Joseph puts his hand on the shoulder of, of Martin because Martin, Martin was seated next to him. And Joseph says to Martin, Martin, you were inspired to say that. And then turning to the rest of the group, he testified that the Savior had been in their midst that night. There are 23 recorded, verified instances of the Savior appearing uh, in the Kirtland area. Um, but it has to come with a little asterisk. Joseph told the people to expect divine manifestations. He taught that regularly. And the people had faith that it would happen. But with that, Joseph would tell them to keep their experiences to themselves, to make a recording in their personal journal, and not to discuss it widely with others. I think that was for two reasons. One, the enemies of the church were starting to come into Kirtland. And any talk of, of divine manifestations could have been considered blasphemous and more reason to inflame their anger against the saints. But perhaps more important than that, the second reason for keeping it to themselves, is it falls in line with what the Savior taught in the New Testament. And that is not to throw pearls before swine, to keep these things sacred to yourself. Uh, Boyd K. Packer, 150 years after, 150, yeah, 150 years after Kirtland, would also give the same counsel and advice, saying in part that uh, that when we have spiritual, personal experiences, it might be best to keep those to ourselves because if we talk about them too often and treat them lightly, the Lord might not trust us with such sacred experiences as frequently as he might otherwise. So of those 23 verified recorded instances, those are just, just 23 times that the Savior appeared in Kirtland. George Q. Cannon in this tabernacle in Salt Lake in the year 1887, in a time when he was pre a, a member of the first presidency, he would, he would say in uh, some remarks that, that the Savior appeared to hundreds of people in the Kirtland era, and each has a record of their own experience, is what he would say. It is a marvelous time, a marvelous ex experience uh, for the saints. Joseph referred to Kirtland, the, the events that were coming, as Pentecostal events. You're familiar with uh, the day of Pentecost in, in the New Testament. He anticipated Pentecostal-like experiences that were coming. And then when they did come, when they were happening, he would refer to them as Pentecostal events. These are the days of Pentecost, he would say. And then even in the past tense, after they left Kirtland in Nauvoo, he would often refer to the experiences in Kirtland as days of Pentecost. Um, the saints would hear this from Joseph and they would expect it. They would expect that their prayers would be answered, that their, that their, that their faith would be recognized and in response, the heavens would open and they would see angels. They would hear voices. Their um, doctrine would be poured out upon them. And it happened. It, it happened and it was real. And sometimes, um, uh, let me get back to that thought, but let me, let me read to you a quote from President Hinckley. President Hinckley he went out to the Kirtland area to dedicate the sites in the early 2000s. Uh, after, all the, uh, after all the historic sites of the Kirtland area had been accumulated with the exception of the temple, um, and they had been renovated, and they, the missionaries were on site, and we were ready to go, and President Hinckley came out to dedicate the sites. And in that prayer, during that prayer, he says this, in no other area of the church, referring to Kirtland, in no other area of the church, was so much revelation received 
In no other place was thy beloved son so revealed to mortal man. In no other place was there such remarkable manifestations given to so many. Now, I won't pretend to interpret President Hinckley's remarks or, or the intent of his remarks, but he says in no other area of the church was so much revelation received. Well, if you look at just the Doctrine and Covenants, the majority of the sections, 60 or the majority meaning i know there's there's <clears throat> let me back up and try to define that again i'll just tell you there's 64 sections in the doctrine and covenants happened in kirtland or the surrounding area 64 now palmyra had four or five uh harmony had 15 far west had a few uh nauvoo a bunch salt lake even ha has a few in there but kirtland has 64 sections of the doctrine and covenants were received there in Kirtland. I think President Hinckley had that in mind. In no other place was thy beloved son so revealed to no mortal man. In no other place was there such remarkable manifestations given to so many. I know President Hinckley had been to the Holy Land. Could he have been comparing it even, even to, to Jerusalem? In no other place was such remarkable manifestations given to so many. Maybe the miracles happened uh, comparatively no doubt or even more so in jerusalem but those who recognized him as being the son of god as those miracles were unfolding perhaps that's what president hinkley meant is there were so many faithful saints that recognized surely this must be the son of god so why is it that kirtland had so many experiences with the savior personally with the savior we're not talking just revelations but the personal appearances of the savior and i don't have the the answer i've got my opinions as to why it was such but here here's my opinion as to why the savior was such a frequent visitor to kirtland in kirtland all the firsts of the church were taking place the first bishop, the first state president, the first high counselor, the first apostles, the first temple ordinances, the first temple, the first bishop storehouse, the first MTC. Lots of firsts were taking place as far as the organization. The first high priests were ordained in this dispensation in, in Kirtland. Um, and, and a lot of these firsts were taking place. And we see a pattern take place of when the Savior appears and what the event is that's taking place. And the commonality between when the Savior appears and what's going on is that the what's going on, the event is something that's happening for the first time in this dispensation. And it's almost as if the Savior himself is present when something new is revealed, either an organization, an ordination, a, a new doctrine. The Savior's there, my opinion, is that he's there to testify that it's true. As people will write in their journals and share and teach and testify later to others and share the message that the Savior was there at this time, I, I think it really puts his stamp of approval on what's taking place. I'm going to share with you four or five of those instances tonight, and, uh, and, you, and you might connect in the direction that I am, um, or you might come up with your own opinion as to why the Savior was so involved in the kirtland era now i told you that there's 23 recorded instances of when the savior appeared in in kirtland and george q cannon expressed that there were hundreds of other experiences that could have been doc uh, uh, um, that could have been documented but i'll ask you and it'll be rhetorical because i know that we, we're not live here in person but how many times did the father appear to the savior now the quick answer is one in the sacred grove in joseph near joseph's home in upstate new york and that's true that that happened but there are recorded instances of the father appearing with the son four times in in kirtland and i emphasize recorded times because perhaps there was more and when are those four times that he appeared i'm going to share with you all four stories tonight uh, but but again, it's my opinion that the Father appeared on those four unique events, again, to testify that this is right, this is true, and this is, this is a good thing to be 
moving forward on. Okay, so that's an introduction to Kirtland. It gives you maybe a little bit of my testimony as to why I love Kirtland and why I, I, I get so excited about it and why, as I disclaimed at the beginning, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of information that that needs to be taught about Kirtland and understood about Kirtland, and we're just going to touch on it just briefly in this in this recording. Um, but how do we get to Kirtland? So timeline-wise, Joseph's in Palmyre, has the first vision, obtains the plates. He moves to Harmony, Pennsylvania with his new, new bride, Emma. They translate the Book of Mormon. They receive uh, Joseph and Oliver Cowdery received the Aaronic priesthood, later the, the Melchizedek priesthood and the keys of apostleship. 75 to 80% of the Book of Mormon is translated. They're, they uh, participate in the ordinance of baptism. Persecution is such that they have to move to Fayette, the Whitmer farm. They're there at the Whitmer farm. They complete the translation of the Book of Mormon. The three witnesses have their experience there at the Whitmer farm. And the church is officially organized April 6, 1830 at the Whitmer farm in Fayette. From the farm in Fayette, Joseph sends out four missionaries, Ziva Peterson, Parley P. Pratt, David um, Oliver Cowdery, and Peter Whitmer Jr. The four of them are sent to fulfill the Book of Mormon prophecy that the, that the Lamanites would receive the gospel in the last day. Joseph defined the Lamanites as being the Native Americans. The president of the United States had just recently kicked the Native Americans out of the country. They're now living in Kansas territory beyond the western border of Missouri. So these four individuals hightail it off to Kansas Territory via Independence, Missouri, which is a whole nother story. And uh, on their way there, they're heading down the Chillicothe Trail. The Chillicothe Trail takes you from the Cleveland area of Ohio down to the Independence area of Missouri. And as they're going down that trail, they end up or they cross through a town called Mentor, Ohio. If you go to Mentor, Ohio, it's just to the north side of the freeway that divides Mentor from, from Kirtland. So super close. So they're there in Kirtland. One of the missionaries is Parley P. Pratt. He's from Mentor. He goes to his friends and family, starts preaching the gospel. They start having wonderful success. One of the individuals who accepts the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it's been restored and taught to him by these missionaries is Sidney Rigdon. Sidney Rigdon has a friend by the name of Edward Partridge. Edward Partridge would be a, the first bishop of the church. Edward Partridge and Sidney Rigdon get so excited and enthused about the restored gospel that they want to go meet the prophet. So they head out 300 miles to the east to meet Joseph in Fayette. They go out, they meet Joseph, they see what's going on in Fayette with the persecution and such. And um, uh, Sidney says to Joseph, in essence, this is a paraphrase, of course, but he says, uh, he says, you know, Joseph, we, there's more members of the church in Ohio than you've got here in, in New York and the surrounding area. We're having great success and we don't have any of the persecution. Maybe you ought to come out to Ohio. Joseph says, I like the sound of that. Let me pray about it. And in answer to Joseph's prayer, he receives the revelation. Go to the Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law and endow you with power from on high. He's talking about the temple. So Joseph and Emma get in a, a horse-drawn sleigh. It's January. Uh, they head out to Ohio. They arrive on February the 3rd, 1831. They walk into the Newell K. Whitney store and answer to Newell K. Whitney's prayer. All of these are wonderful stories. You'll have to get another day. But now we've got Joseph in Kirtland. And now that's where the headquarters are. All these firsts that I listed start happening. All these divine manifestations start happening. Now, before we go on, I have to make one thing perfectly clear. I'm going to use the word vision a lot. As you read those 60, 64 sections from the Doctrine and Covenants that took place in or around the Kirtland area, you'll, hear, you'll read the word vision. Joseph had a vision. I saw in vision. The Lord revealed to me through vision. Well, in, in this year, present day, the word vision might make us think of something that happens when we're sleeping. Or something that we that we see that's not real, uh, like we're watching a movie. Well, if you look at the 1829 Webster's Dictionary, the word vision it means just the opposite of what I just described, or the or just the opposite of what we would think that the word vision means today. In the 1829 Webster's Dictionary, it says. Uh, one word, singular word definition for vision, and that single word is reality. When Joseph said he had a vision, 
he meant that he had a real, tangible, physical experience. When we say that Joseph had a fir his first vision in the spring of 1820, we're not using the word vision appropriately because we, the way that is, we use it in today isn't the way Joseph used it in his day. What Joseph meant is when he had the first vision in the sacred grove in upstate New York is he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ face to face. And as Moses would describe, he had the same experience. He talked with God and Jesus as a man talks and converses with, with deity or, or, or as, as man converses with each other. So it was with Joseph conversing with deity. So as we talk about vision tonight, remember that every time Joseph referred to something as a vision, it was real is what he was saying. This really actually happened. So let's talk about some of the actual real things that happened. I want to show to you uh, some pictures. In fact, you're going to see, and I doubt you're going to uh, complain, uh, but you're going to see me a lot less in, um, in this recording because I'm going to show you some pictures instead. Okay. And it's coming. Okay. Now, the, what you're seeing here on your screen, there it is. This is the office of Joseph, Joseph's office in the Kirtland Temple. It's on the third floor, the furthest west room that you can get to. And this is what it looks like today. This is where Joseph, uh, this was his office. This was the headquarters of the church. This is where a lot of revelations were received. Um, the revelations that were received in Kirtland, a lot of them were right here in this very room. I want to share with you one um, vision that took place here. And now you all are educated on what vision means. So in this room, some things really did happen. Okay, but I got to take you back to the year 1823. In September 1823, Joseph's praying. He gets into bed. He's just about to close his eyes when Moroni appears. He has three consecutive visions of Moroni. The morning breaks. He goes to work. Moroni appears again, gives him the same instruction, but this time, go to the hill, I'll meet you there. So he goes to the hill, he sees the plates, he's not allowed to take them out. He has to put the, he has to put the rock back over the plates and go home. The plates are still in the hill. 45-ish days later, Joseph's older brother, Alvin, dies. It's heartbreaking and devastating to the entire family. You gotta remember, the year is 1823. The church has not been restored. The Book of Mormon, is, the plates are still in the hill, and Joseph has only had his first vision or that first experience there in the grove. That's it. Nothing else has been revealed yet. And this is the background you've got to understand for what happened in this room. So before Alvin dies, Joseph goes into the bedroom to where Alvin's laying on his deathbed, and Alvin is saying goodbye to Joseph. And this is what he says. Alvin says to Joseph, I want you to be a good boy and do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record. Be faithful in receiving instruction and in keeping every commandment that is given you. Now, what's Alvin saying? He's saying, I believe you, little brother. I believe that you saw what you said you saw in the grove behind the house. And I believe that you were instructed by an angel to obtain plates, but you haven't gotten them yet. I believe that you saw them. Alvin never saw them. Not a single character off the plates had been translated into the English language. Yet Alvin had a testimony that his little brother was a prophet of God, that he, he was selected to, re, to be an instrument in the hands of the Lord in restoring the church of Jesus Christ to the earth. And he had a testimony that the Book of Mormon was true. Even though they didn't, know, even at that time, they didn't even know that the book was called the Book of Mormon. He knew that the plates contained the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed by him to the ancient inhabitants of this continent, as Moroni told Joseph and as Joseph told his brother. So he had a testimony. Well, Alvin dies. The minister comes and does a graveside service, 
And as kind of a warning shot to Joseph, he preaches that Alvin, because he hadn't been baptized, was now in hell. He was dwelling in hell among the the, uh, devils who were tormenting him for life or for all of eternity, and that he was doomed to destruction and that the family would never, ever see Alvin again. Lucy, the mother, I, I, I can't even pretend that I could comprehend the pain and anguish that she and any mother who buries their child would feel. But with the only, but with the knowledge of the afterlife being just what the preacher told her, she writes in her journal, We all, with one accord, wept over our irretrievable loss, and we could not be comforted because he was not. Now, a few words in there that I'll point out. We wept over our irretrievable loss. She believed that she would never see Alvin again. And we could not be comforted because he was not. Our pain cannot slow down because we know that he is an eternal Tur- uh, torment. Well, that was Lucy's understanding for the next 13 years. And for the next for the next 13 years, that's all Lucy understood. Well, it was in that room, the picture that I just showed you, that a vision opened up. And Joseph saw, in reality, what's recorded in section 137. The heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God. And the glory thereof, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. I saw the transcendent beauty and the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter. I also saw the blazing throne of God, whereupon was seated the Father and the Son. In that room that I just showed you a picture of, Joseph was there. Joseph's father was there. Hiram was there, and there's good reason to believe that there were a few others in the room as well. Those were the mortals who were in the room. Who also attended this sacred event? The Father and the Son, as recorded in section 137, verse 3. And then he continues with what he saw. I saw the beautiful streets that that kingdom, meaning the celestial kingdom, which had the appearance of being paved with gold, and then others appeared to Joseph. I saw Father Adam and Abraham, my father and my mother, and my brother Alvin, who has long since slept, and marveled how it was that he had obtained an inheritance that kingdom, seeing that he had departed this life before the Lord had set his hand together Israel the second time and had not been baptized for the remission of sins. Thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it had they been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Now, as I told you a few minutes ago, in my opinion, the Savior and the Father appear when new doctrine had been revealed to give their stamp of approval and to testify themselves that this new thing that's being taught is true and it's real and it's right. And that's why we have the Father and the Son. See, those men, those mortals who were in the room, could later teach and testify the father and son were there and this is what was taught therefore if you believe in christ you believe in god the father you by default you believe in this doctrine and what's the doctrine that's taught well alvin i taught you had had a testimony of joseph's prophetic calling and of the the book of mormon and because he died with that testimony he was permitted to enter the celestial kingdom even though he hadn't been baptized And what else do we learn in there? Joseph glosses over it because he gets so fixated on Alvin. But in verse 5, he says, I saw Father Adam and Abraham and my father. Well, I also told you the historical context of this section that his dad was sitting next to him in the room. And yet, even though Father Smith in the flesh is sitting next to him in the room, he sees him in this vision in the celestial kingdom with Alvin. So what's the doctrine that we learn here? Families are forever, or families can be forever. So the vision closes. Father Smith, Joseph, uh, Father Smith, who is Joseph Sr., Joseph Jr., and Hiram are there. 
Joseph relates section 137 to his dad and his brother. Can you imagine how fast those three men descended two flights of stairs in the Kirtland Temple, ran out the front door and down the street, threw open the screen door of Mother Smith's front door, and Joseph would have said, Mother, it's okay. It's all right. The pain you've been feeling for 13 years can be gone. Because here is true doctrine. And it's not just doctrine that we want to accept. It's doctrine that is authenticated by the personal appearance and stamp of approval of the Father and the Son. It must have been a happy day in the Smith home that night as, uh, as they contemplated where Alvin was and the potential they had of being reunited with him. All these wonderful, glorious blessings that they were enjoying because of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, they now knew that Alvin was enjoying the same and that one day they would enjoy them with him. Okay, I want to show you another picture. It takes just a second to flip it over, flip it around. Here it goes. Okay, now this picture, this is the upstairs room of the Johnson home. John Johnson and, uh, and his wife and, and their several children lived in this home. This is a room. It was the master bedroom until Joseph needed to get out of Kirtland. And when he needed to get out of Kirtland because of persecution for a time, he came down here to, the, to Hiram, Ohio. It's about a 30 miles south of, of Kirtland. And, um, and they gave up their master bedroom and converted it into an office for Joseph. Well, Joseph, so this became headquarters of the church. And it's in this very sacred room that uh, the missionaries today refer to as the Revelation Room. It's estimated that in this room, Joseph received upwards of 1,000 revelations. Of course, as Book of Mormon prophets say, only a hundredth part uh, is recorded and available for, for us to read in the Doctrine and Covenants. But revelation continually poured out upon Joseph in this room. In this room, there was a vision that took place. Let me remind you of what vision means, right? And during this vision, Joseph, along with his scribe, and, and uh, uh, along with his scribe, Sidney Rigdon, they would be enveloped in a vision. And what I mean by enveloped is they wouldn't just see and hear, but they were, they were inside it. In fact, later in Nauvoo, Joseph would testify, I don't know if the celestial kingdom came to us or we went to it, but we were in the celestial kingdom. The vision that I'm referring to is section 76, and it was of such great importance to the saints in that day as it is to us that before it was labeled section 76, it was referred to by the members of the church simply as the vision. And what a vision it was. Um, we, we won't go through the doctrine of section 76. I'd love to take an hour and do that another time. But to keep on, on our topic of, the, of tonight of the Savior's appearance in this room, I'll tell you uh, briefly how, how section 76 went about <clears throat> section 76 is like no other revelation in all the doctrine and covenants uh, joseph uh, was working on the inspired translation of the bible sydney rigdon was his scribe they came upon the fifth chapter of john which talks about the resurrection of the just and the unjust uh, this seemed contrary or this was contrary to the common thought of Christianity of the day, uh, where uh, it, it was taught throughout the, world, the Christian world that there's one heaven, one hell. You qualify for one or the other. You're either a great person or you're a bad person. There's no in-betweenies. And uh, that's the way it was taught. 
Well, here in section 76, as you might be familiar with, it's, or, or as he was translating the book of John, he was, um, it, 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 it struck him as odd that there were different resurrections, le essentially levels of resurrection um, or types of resurrection, the just and the unjust. And he and Sidney inquired of the Lord as to what this might mean. And section 76, the vision, uh, was received. The, the vision was not received like all the other revelations in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants. As I said, Joseph was unsure if he went to the celestial kingdom or if it came to him. Uh, this wasn't something that he was getting through his mind as, as a revelatory experience. This was a, a real physical, tangible experience that he was having. Uh, Philo Dibble, who was there, he did not see the vision, although he testified he felt the power of it as he witnessed the men, those two men receiving the vision. Uh, he said that it lasted for hours. Joseph and Sidney would uh, go be taken through this vision, and at intervals they would be commanded, and you can read this in section 76, where they were commanded to stop and write what they were seeing, what they were hearing. But here's how it was so significantly different. And as you go back and read section 76 and you start paying attention or looking for these details, you'll, you'll see that it's so clear as to how this was so different. One, this was what Joseph referred to as a tour through the eternities. And who was their tour guide? The Savior himself. The Savior himself took them through a tour of the eternities, first taking them to the pre-existence. They saw the council in heaven, the war in heaven, the casting out of, of the adversary and his followers. Uh, they saw earth life. They saw the ju uh, resurrection, judgment, and the three degrees of glory. Um, I'll read to you a couple of things out of that section that emphasizes our, our topic that we have here tonight. And that is a couple of things here, starting in verse 19. This is how the vision begins. And while we meditated upon these things, the resurrection of the just and unjust, as I've described, the Lord touched the eyes of our understanding, and they were opened. And the glory of the Lord shone round about. And we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father and received of his fullness. Here we have again the appearance of the Father and the Son at a time when new doctrine, completely foreign to the Christian world, was being introduced. And that was not only the plan of salvation, but the doctrine that there is a salvation available for everyone, with the exception of the sons of perdition, who are very few in number. But that, that A level of salvation could be obtained by all of God's children was not only new doctrine, but it was contrary to the, that day's Christian belief and acceptance. And so we had the Father and the Son appearing, giving their testimony that this is right, it's true. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's how we're moving forward. Verse 22, Joseph, and now after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the task, testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. This is a very sacred uh, room. Um, you don't have to visit it to understand the sacredness of it. But the, the heavens were open multiple times. And in this room uh, is, a, is one of those spots where both the Father and the Son appeared. I want to share with you a, a, a one, more a one more story that no i've got two more I mean, we've got to do two more uh two more stories here the first one comes from this location this is the newell k whitney store <clears throat> newell k whitney was a bishop of the church the first bishop storehouse um is just behind those windows on on your right when you're looking at it. it's the far right first floor 
uh, on the far left, first floor, that's where Newell K. Whitney opened up the first Walmart Supercenter. It's, it really is what it was. And uh, so he, uh, he uh, had a shop there. Up upstairs in the far left window, just above the NK, is, is, uh, is where Joseph and Emma's bedroom were. To the far right is a room that Joseph used as his office. Now, you can't see it from the exterior because it's just behind his office to the back of the house is this room. This room is referred to as the School of the Prophets. This was Joseph's office for a time. Many sacred events took place in this little tiny room. In this room, Joseph would gather the future leaders of the church, and he would teach them the doctrines of the kingdom. He would prepare them to be the future leaders, and, uh, and that's why it was called the School of the Prophets. <clears throat> Lots of things were revealed in here, um, and Joseph had revelation in this room and also in the adjoining room, which was also his office. But in this room, the first first presidency was um, sustained and set apart. They had the first solemn assembly. You may have participated in the solemn assembly when past presidents of the church have been sustained in general conference. That's exactly what happened in this little room. Joseph called Frederick uh, Sidney Rigdon as first counselor and Frederick G. Williams as his second counselor. They were sustained by the men who were in the room. And, uh, and then they, uh, one at a time, sat and were set apart in their respective callings. This is the location of the first, first presidency. Joseph told the brethren who were, who were uh, to be coming uh, to that meeting that if they prepared themselves, that they would see heavenly visions. And... Uh, and, and, they, and they did prepare themselves, and they did see those heavenly visions. Here is the quote from Joseph. I laid my hands on Brother Sidney and Frederick and ordained them to take part with me in holding the keys of this last kingdom. I gave the brother a promise, this is what I was referring to, that the pure in heart should see a heavenly vision. And after remaining a short time in secret prayer, the promise was verified. You see, Joseph set them apart, first and second counselor in the first presidency, the first, first presidency since the days of the apostles. And then they knelt down and they prayed silently, everybody on your own. I'll continue with Joseph's um, quote. And, and the promises were verified for many present had, had the eyes of their understanding opened by the spirit of God. So as to behold many things, many of the brethren saw a heavenly vision of the Savior and concourses of angels, and many other things of which each has a record of what he saw. Zebedee Coltrane was in the room that day, and he said this, I saw him, and suppose the others did. And Joseph answered, that is Jesus, the Son of God, our elder brother. Then speaking of the Father, Zebedee said, he was surrounded as with a flame of fire, which was so brilliant that I could not discover anything else but his person. I saw his hands, his legs, his feet, his eyes, nose, mouth, head, and body in the shape and form of a perfect man. This appearance was so grand and overwhelming that it seemed I should melt down in his presence. The sensation was so powerful that it thrilled through my whole system and I felt it in the marrow of my bones. He also related, the prophet Joseph said that is the father. And Zebedee concludes his testimony by saying, I saw him. John Murdoch speaks of this occasion. During the winter of 1833, we had a number of prayer meetings in the prophet's chamber. In one of those meetings, the prophet told us, if we could humble ourselves before God and exercise strong faith, we should see the face of the Lord. And about midday, the visions of my mind were opened and the eyes of my understanding were enlightened. And I saw the form of a man, most lovely. The visage of his face was sound and fair as the sun. His hair had bright silver gray, curled in most majestic form. His eyes a keen, penetrating blue, and the skin of his neck a most beautiful white. And he was covered from neck 
to the feet was a loose garment, pure white, whiter than any garment I had ever seen. His countenance was most penetrating and yet most lovely. And while I was endeavoring to comprehend the whole personage from head to feet, it slipped from me. But it left on my mind the impression of love for months that I had never felt before to that degree. Now, here's John Murdoch. He's in this room. He just participated in a solemn assembly. The Savior appears. Joseph stands, points to the Savior, as Zebedee Coltrane testifies. And Joseph says of the Savior, uh, that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And after the Savior departs this room, the Father appears. And John Murdoch gives us such a detailed description of exactly what the Father looks like. But what was it that was most impressive to him? Did you catch it in the quote? He talks about his eyes, his hair, his, his feet, what he's wearing, the glory, the light, the color of his hair, his skin. But what was it that left the impression on him for months? The feeling of love. It was the feeling of love that impressed him more than here's God the Father in our presence. The feeling of love outshined the brightness and glory. It outshone the colors and the experience of what was happening. It was the love that, that overtook all of those other considerations, which was just the opposite of everything being taught about God in those days. You see, in those days, it was you got to fear God because he's going to look for an opportunity to smite you to hell. And here comes the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says, no, that's not right. And we're not going to believe in those false traditions any longer. Our Heavenly Father gives nothing but a feeling of love. And to back that up, Joseph has the vision down in the Johnson farm saying this loving God through the atoning grace of his son is going to save to some degree everybody. Now that salvation to one degree or another, but there is a type or a limit of salvation available for all. This is turning the Christian world on its head. And the, the saints, the women and the men and the children, they're embracing it, not because they, well, they do like it, but not only because they like it, but because it feels right. It, it's, it, it, it's coming together. They're getting their testimony, just as each of us, individual members of the church, we must gain our own testimony by way of the Spirit. Although they're seeing the Father, they're seeing the Son, they're seeing angels, in the Kirtland Temple, if, if we were going to spend time on the Kirtland Temple tonight, we would talk about the day of dedication when angels were seen, voices were heard, the choirs of heaven were ringing out. But although that was reassuring and comforting and it, it buoyed them up as to what they were a part of, each of them testify, as, as I just read these individuals testifying, that it was the Spirit that cemented their, their testimony of the reality of the restoration. And that's just how it works for, for us in, in, today's, in today. Let me conclude here with one more appearance of deity. This one happened in the Kirtland Temple. I just told you I wasn't going to talk about the Kirtland Temple. I meant the construction of the Kirtland Temple and, and the uh, events that took place and the day of dedication. And we could spend three or four or five or 20 hours on the Kirtland Temple, but let me just share with you briefly something that happened here on these pulpits. If you'll turn to section 110, this is where I reference this. The Savior appears in the Kirtland Temple many times. I told you the story about appearing in regards to Alvin's salvation. That was in the upstairs room. This is on the west end of the Kirtland Temple on the main floor. And Joseph, this is on April 6th, a week after the temple had been dedicated. And Joseph and Oliver go up to the pulpits. They draw down these curtains. They call them a veil. They call, 
don't confuse it with the veil of, of today's temple. It was a, it was a separation. It was a, to divide the room. And so they, they drew down that veil to be uh, alone and they started to pray to the Lord. And what happened is recorded in section 110. And again, Joseph refers to this as a vision and we know better uh, about what a vision means. So the Lord appears on those pulpits. Verse 2 of 110, we saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold and color like amber. His eyes were a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who is slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Behold, your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice. Let me make two or three commentaries on uh, make two or three commentaries on these verses. One, we saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit. That's the picture you're seeing. He describes what the Savior looks like. Now, why did the Savior come? He tells us later in, in section 110, he came to accept the house. The house had been dedicated. The Savior accepted it. And because he accepted it, he was able to do a lot of things. But here's the top four. One, Moses, Elias, and Elijah were able to return, bestowing keys of the priesthood upon the heads of Joseph and Oliver. Now, we could say, the restoration's taking place. It's not complete, as we know from today's prophets and apostles, the, revel the restoration is still continuing, but we've now got all the keys have been restored. These three keys permit of the gathering of Israel and the bestowal of all the blessings that are contained in the Abrahamic covenant, all the blessings that a loving Heavenly Father could bestow upon his children, members of the church, are now available. So the Savior comes, he brings with him Moses, Elias, and Elijah to restore all the keys so that you and I can obtain every blessing that's permittable to mortals during this life from our Heavenly Father. And then the fourth thing, and this is the top four because we could list 20 things, but a fourth thing that I'll mention is now that the house, the temple has been accepted, temple ordinances can now be completed. There were no uh, proxy ordinances done in the temple. When you read the historical accounts in the journals, they talk about receiving their endowments in the Kirtland Temple. That's not the way we understand endowments today. What they received in the Kirtland Temple were what we refer to as initiatory work. The initiatory work took place in the Kirtland Temple in Joseph's office, that picture I showed you previously, and uh, they were done just for the living. It would be in Nauvoo that the full endowment as we practice it today was revealed and proxy work was done. The other thing that I'll point out to you, give a little commentary on these first five verses of section 110, is the Savior testifies of himself. I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I'm your advocate with the Father. In other words, I completed the atonement. The atonement is done. Because the atonement is completed, if you keep my commandments the best you can and come unto me as your Savior and follow my commandments, then you have an opportunity to, verse 5, be forgiven of your sins and come unto the Father. But here's what I really like about that. He not only testifies of who he is as way of saying the atonement is complete and is for real. But now he's saying, because I completed a perfect atonement, therefore lift up your heads and rejoice. Now, Joseph and Oliver were going through some trials and troubles, and they were getting worse by the day. And we could say the same is true in our day. We've got some trials and troubles, and uh, some of them are personal. Some of them affect communities, nations, the whole world. But there's some things going on. And the Savior stepping in and saying to Joseph during his times of trials, as he does for our times of trials, hey, 
I'm the savior. I completed the perfect atonement. I'm your advocate. So go ahead and rejoice because it's all going to be okay. Now, what does the word advocate mean? Oh, well, we could go to Webster, but I like going to the Savior better. In section 45, he tells us exactly what advocate means. Section 45, verse 3, listen to him who is your advocate with the Father. Meaning, listen to me. I, I'm your advocate. That's my role. So hear what I've got to say. I'm your advocate with the Father, verse 3, who is pleading your cause before him, saying. So the Savior is speaking for himself. I'm your advocate, and this is what I'm saying to the Father on behalf of you. Father, behold the sufferings of death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy son, which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thou might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these my brethren that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. Now we've talked about the appearance of deity, the Father and Son. We've talked about why they appeared. And um, I've given you just a few examples of some of the times that they've appeared. And I've concluded with section 110 and 45 to, uh, as my testimony and as my opinion as to why it, they came to Kirtland so frequently and so often was to teach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is our advocate with the Father, and it's as Joseph said, that by him and through him, we can one day return to live with our Heavenly Father. And of all the doctrines that are contained in those six, 64 sections of the Doctrine and Covenants that were revealed in, six, 60, in Kirtland, I think that's the point of it all. And I'll share with you from those 64 sections a few verses of the Savior testifying of the same. Just a few phrases of those. I was in the beginning with the Father and am the firstborn. I am Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I am from above. I am over all and in all and through all. I am Alpha and Omega, even Jesus Christ. I am the Lord of hosts. I, the Lord, even Jesus Christ, am the Son of the living God. I am the true light. I am in the Father and the Father in me. I was in the world and dwelt among the sons of men. I am he who liveth. I am he who is slain. I am your advocate with the Father. I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world. So of all the reasons that perhaps the Savior appeared in Kirtland, Perhaps the greatest reason of all is to come and testify of himself so that we might believe in him, come unto him, and be able to qualify to return to our, our Heavenly Father. And this I testify of in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is a small snippet of Kirtland. Um, I'm going to be working on a lot more Kirtland stuff. And if you'd be interested, then, then go ahead and visit the blog and Check out the videos that are, they're, they're available and they're there for you. Uh, my, this recording is going to be posted on there as well as all the others that I make. It's tomcpettit.com is the blog. If you've got any questions, shoot me an email. If you've got a topic that you'd like me to, to maybe research on and, and do a few-minute broadcast on, I'd be happy to do that too. If you send me an email, I'll be happy to look at that perhaps. But other than that, I uh, thank you for attending and joining. I hope this was worthwhile to you and not a waste of your time, but I I hope that uh, that it was beneficial and perhaps something that uh, that you expected and and uh, maybe we'll see you next time. But for that, have a wonderful evening and good night.